What is up, everybody? Michael Harnum here speaking. Thank you for your time and attention today. Uh, having some video trouble on my end, so uh, hopefully you can hear the audio fine. And my, my press photo is airbrushed, so trust me, the, uh, the photo on your screen is a lot better looking than the real thing anyways. So um, looking forward to sharing uh, some insight that, that I've gained in the marketplace with you. Hopefully you find it helpful. Uh, so I'm the chief executive officer of a company called ESG. We do customer success as a service. Uh, it is an outsourced customer success solution. I mention that because our clients are all customer success leaders, and our perspective on the marketplace is pretty broad based upon our ability to work inside of customer success organizations on behalf of customer success leaders in a variety of different sized companies in a variety of different industries. And so we've got a pretty broad perspective um, of the customer success marketplace. And I wanted to share some of that perspective with you today in terms of how to capitalize now that you are getting the C-suite's attention for your customer success practice, how do you make the most of that? And based upon the, the data that we're seeing um, in a recent study that we did in conjunction with Turn Zero and Higher Logic, as well as some other reporting I've seen recently from, from TSIA, uh, that attention is, is growing, right? Budgets for customer success are growing. Uh, the seat at the table, the reporting structure is becoming more advantageous for customer success leaders. So we're beginning to get the attention that we want. And I just wanted to share some ideas with you in terms of how you make the most of that. And so the first concept I want to start with is, you know, the, the, the fact that your belief system influences your actions, right? So what you believe influences what you do. A simple example I would use is if you believe that exercise is healthy for you, promotes longevity, clear thinking, all of the benefits, if, if you believe in that, then you are much more likely to um, act upon that belief system and, and exercise more. Um, and so if you apply some of that thinking to, to customer success, uh, I, I've got one foundational question for you. And if, if you, uh, like me, are occasionally guilty of multitasking, I, I would ask you to give me five minutes here. Um, if, if you want to multitask after the five minutes, that's great. But I, I really believe this question that I'm going to ask and the data that I'm going to provide an answer to it is, is the central focus of the message that I have today and something that a lot of customer success leaders miss. And, and that question is this. Do you believe that customer success is pivotal to your company's success? Is it necessary? I'll say it on an inverse way uh, to, to clarify the point. Without a strong customer success strategy, do you believe your company would fail? And I would argue that if you're not sure and you don't immediately jump to yes, uh, then I would stop there, right? And connecting your belief system about the importance of, of customer success to your overall company success is a very, very relevant one. You just, if you don't believe that with every fiber of your being, that you have to be great at this as a company to succeed, then everything else I say and all of the recommendations I make probably will fall a little bit flat. And so I want to give you a little bit of data that, that I look at that, that convinces me that most companies, if not all companies, have to be great at customer success or they're in for some, some pain in the future. And so I'm looking at a report from a company called SAS Capital. Uh, it's at www.sas-capital.com. And in the first quarter of each year, they conduct a survey of B2B SaaS companies and their metrics. And um, they've got 1,500 private B2B SaaS companies responding, which makes it the largest survey of its type. And so they're asking about the correlation between retention rates and growth rates. It's one of the things that I'm going to call out of this. Um, it's about a six-page report. Um, I'm going to really highlight one sentence out of it. And to me, this really galvanizes the importance of being good at customer success to the future growth of your company. 
And so if you look at in this analysis, the median net retention for all companies in the survey was 99%, okay? And then if you clump the respondents, 1,500 companies into two categories, one is those companies that have net retention below the median, right? So below the median of 99%, they show growth rates of 17.4%, right? So if you're below 99% net retention, you grow at a rate of 17.4%, okay? If you are above 99%, your growth rate is 42%, okay? So outpacing your peers in terms of net retention can mean the difference between your company growing 17% and 42%. And when you think about what that means from a revenue and a profit and a jobs and an expansion and an investment in the business standpoint, that is a massive gap if you are good at retaining your customers or not. Now, I would connect that obviously to customer success from the perspective of you're not going to retain your customers if you're not good at customer success. And so that 17 to 42% gap becomes very, very meaningful and your customer success practice sits right in the middle of that. Okay, so I would encourage you to go forward with that belief system behind you with you know, the data that is important to you and your role and your company, uh, but know for sure that if customer success isn't working inside of a B2B SaaS organization, uh, you are unlikely to succeed and there's plenty of data to, to support that. So in terms of how I think about making the most of the time that you have with your customer, um, I'm sorry, with your executives to talk about customer success. Um, I've talked with a lot of customer success leaders who are in this exact place, you know, where they have the opportunity, whether it's an executive review, an offsite leadership meeting, a board meeting, depending on the situation where you get to manage up, manage up being a key priority here. And so as, as you see on the slide, I mean, the first thing that I think about here is playing offense, okay? Again, really, really important. You're playing offense here. And I see a lot of people not doing that. And let me give you an example of what I mean by playing offense. I'll be talking to customer success leaders and they'll say things like, well, first thing I, you know, I've got a new chief customer officer, I've got a new CEO, and I gotta find out what they think about customer success. Okay, I, I, I think that's the wrong approach. Now, of course, you need to know the perspective of your upline, but I would argue playing offense in delivering your perspective and trying to influence and color the perspective of that executive is a much better approach that gives you a higher chance to succeed, right? So playing offense, meaning you've got a perspective, we're gonna run through a tick list of things here that I think are important there, but you've got a perspective that you're going to share in play and offense. Um, the first way that you can play offense, in my view, is setting the agenda. Again, this sounds super fundamental, super basic. I see so many people that don't do this and don't do it well. Setting the agenda, and here's what that primarily involves. It's an emphasis on leading indicators versus lagging indicators. What do I mean by that? So. If you don't set the agenda and you're not playing offense, you could be put in a situation where your executive team, whoever you're meeting with, comes to a conclusion that says, well, we've invested in customer success. We now have a customer success thing. Therefore, revenue retention should be going through the roof, right? So if we spent this money, why isn't my retention immediately going up? Uh, my renewal rate, whatever lagging metric they're looking at, right? And so, um, if you allow the focus of the conversation to be exclusively on lagging indicators, um, unless you have a tremendously mature and well-funded customer success organization, that's probably not gonna play well for you. So one of the things we recommend that our, um, our clients do is focus further upstream. How do you get the conversation further upstream? One way that we do that is talking about capabilities that the customer success organization has today that they didn't have last month, six months ago. And so you could baseline where your capabilities were, right? And, and say, for example, you didn't have um, an integrated digital 
customer success strategy where you could reach out to your install base of customers with a proactive informed message and you didn't have humans sitting behind that to follow up on that. Perhaps you didn't have your journey map documented and you didn't have your customer health index, your red, yellow, green built so that you could take the appropriate action based on the current state of that customer. Okay, those are all, when I say capabilities, those are all capabilities that I'm talking about. And so the message, rather than focusing on the lagging indicator or revenue impact, if you're just not quite there yet, would be, let's consider the capabilities that we have today that we didn't have six months ago that put us in a better position to drive a positive revenue result. And that list of capabilities is here. Here's how we are utilizing those capabilities by customer segment. And here's what we expect the results to, uh, to be that we are going to drive. Completely different conversation versus playing defense and you walk into a meeting and someone says, well, you know, we've spent a million dollars on customer success and our retention hasn't moved. Why not? Not a good spot to be in. Okay. Secondly, um, I would encourage you to have an informed perspective. So when you come out of the gate with perspective, what is the supporting um, information that you have that surrounds that perspective? So you think about how I introduced some concepts on this call, right? Like if we're going to talk about how your belief system influences your actions, right? It's response that that's my perspective that your belief system informs your actions. Okay. Well, how is that informed? Right. And so I walked you through a report that says, if your belief system is this, your actions would be that. And here's the support. Sorry, folks, not sure why that keeps dropping, but uh, I'll, I'll stay with it and, and keep going. Um, and then, so after an informed perspective would be infusing your message with data. And a couple things come to mind there in terms of examples of how you could, you know, utilize the data that you're seeing in your business. One would be um, highlighting segment level performance. I mean, I think the higher up you go into an organization, the more they tend to talk about customers as a clump. Right, and all customers are the same, and what are our customers doing? Well, we know as CS professionals that the behavior of different segments of customers is very, very different depending on their size and what they're trying to, to get done. And so you might have a very di different, for example, some companies have an adoption rate index. You know, what features are being utilized, how frequently are they being utilized, and they measure the adoption rate. That adoption rate could be very, very different by customer segment. It could be time to value, right? And this would highlight your capabilities in onboarding. But again, it might take you 120 days or perhaps six months to get from implementation to value for an enterprise customer, where perhaps a, a smaller mid-market or down in your long tail segment uh, might be able to get to value faster, or perhaps it's the inverse. But the point remains the same is understand the difference by segment and know that data and be able to speak to it. Um, and then the other way to do it, which is a little bit less reliant on systems, would be willingness to be an advocate for, for your company. How many of your customers by segment are willing to speak out positively and are speaking out positively about you in a variety of forums? And then I would encourage each of you to tell your story using direct customer input. A lot of us are limited by systems access, by tools, by data. Perhaps I don't have scorecards and perhaps I don't have dashboards, that's okay. My recommendation here would be become the customer expert. This becomes really, really important as you move up the chain in the org chart and, and this is really your armor to make your arguments. Um, you really don't need systems to be good at this. And I would challenge each of you to be more engaged with your customers than others in that room would be. And so if you are regularly talking to customers, your team is, and you are directly talking to customers about a concept like value realization and asking the question, what value did you expect from our platform and are you getting that value? 
Uh, that is tremendously valuable. And if you begin to tie your story using that direct customer input to the bullet points that are listed above here on the slide, you can begin to influence others to your point of view, because most likely the rest of them in the room aren't regularly communicating to customers as directly as you can in your role, right? So value realization is a great place to start with that, or if you're already talking to customers, a great thing to emphasize. Are you realizing the, what value did you expect, and are you realizing that value? And then infusing that story into all of your messaging um, in your upline is, is super critical. Um, next would be making a recommendation. I would encourage each of you to start as many sentences as you possibly can with the two words, I recommend, or therefore I recommend, right? And so if you're following the flow of these bullets, right, and you've done everything above, make a recommendation, you could easily get to a place, well, therefore I recommend that we implement this or we alter our strategy to that, right? And it's, it's just one additional way that you can play offense in these sessions is by, you know, making a, a recommendation and starting your sentences with, with I recommend. And then the last one here is you're probably in a room where uh, corporate objectives have been uh, discussed and agreed upon at an annual level, right? And so any recommendation that you're making would benefit your customers, would benefit your customer success organization, but make sure you're tying it to be the best you can to a corporate objective. Right, and so let's let these corporate objectives tend to be higher level. And so thinking, you know, they're, they're macro concepts. I'm thinking of something like, um, you know, prioritize customer retention or, you know, customer first. Uh, they tend to have be objectives like that, and then you would have specific measurements tied to that. So any of the recommendations that you're making, especially in you know a room with uh, with C level executives if you can tie what you're recommending to the benefit of an agreed upon corporate objective, I think that would help you play offense as well. So again, in summary here, you're setting the agenda, you're walking in with an informed perspective, you're infusing your message with data, you're talking to customers that enable you to tell a story that makes all of that very, very real, you are making a recommendation, starting sentences with I recommend, and then you're tying that recommendation to a corporate objective. Um, and so when I say play offense, it's, it's those six things that form the framework of how I recommend that you do that. And then the next point here is embracing even seeking discomfort. Um, I've got this, uh, this, this other concept that I will, I will roll out to you here that is um, around the I would call it the obsession that we have as a society with, with comfort. And you think of like the, the temperature regulated environments you live in, right? Your home is regulated. If it's too hot, the air conditioner is on. If it's too cold, the heat's on. You get into your car and it's temperature regulated. You go to your office, it's temperature regulated. We're not going outside until, you know, it's 72 degrees. Um, and so we're living in a, a very comfortable um uh, environment uh, that is temperature regulated. And, I, it, and there is benefit to discomfort. And if I follow along my analogy of if you're never outside of, you know, 71, 72 degrees, there are certain things physiologically that just do not happen. And this may sound weird to you, but, you know, I, I, I push the envelope on these things. But a few times a week, I will do a, a routine at the gym I go to where I'm in a steam room for 10 minutes, I'm in a sauna for 10 minutes, and then I'm in a cold plunge for 10 minutes or a cold shower, right? And why I do that is there are things that happen once you get out of your comfort zone, there are things that happen in your body physiologically when your core temperature rises to a certain degree and then when it is lowered to a certain degree. And those things are good. Yes, they're initially a little bit uncomfortable, but in the end, it is a positive outcome. The same concept applies in our business world, right? We're going to need to get out of the things that we know to do, embrace, even seek discomfort, 
And what I mean by that is customer success is a cross-functional um, profession. It's a cross-functional discipline. It requires the involvement of sales and of marketing and of ops and um, customer service and all the other departments to be successful. And that requires you to work with some interesting personalities, right? And to be good at your job, you need to be able to navigate that um, and perhaps have some uncomfortable conversations, forge alliances and relationships with people that you may not agree with and and take it from there and then the final point here that that i would leave you with today is you're gonna have to have thick skin right i've summarized it here as be resilient and be relentless and expect pushback uh you're gonna get it right this is a new concept in a lot of organizations um customer success and the amount of energy, the amount of fight, the amount of push we have, knowing that we're right. And so if I end where we started, if your belief system is informing your actions and your belief system says, we have to be good at customer success, it is our future, or we will not succeed as an organization, you're really going to have to remind yourself every single day that you believe that and fortify that belief with additional data as it becomes available. And you're going to have to be resilient. You're going to have to be relentless in your pursuit and proliferation of that point of view inside of your organization. I find that if you expect pushback, it stings a little less when it comes because you're going to get it. You might be experiencing that today. Um, but if you um, are resilient and relentless and you truly do believe, it will feel very, very natural to have conversations with people that may not believe to the extent that you do. So I would encourage each of you to uh, be students of this game um, and a reminder that, you know, we all wanted this attention. Uh, if you go back a few years ago, we were having trouble getting a seat at the table as customer success leaders. We got it now. I would encourage each of you to make the most of it, and please let me know where I can help. Thank you for your time today.